Hey guys, Mr. Die here. About to read Charlie and the Chocolate Factory in one of my favorite places and my favorite chair here. I'm going to read chapter 10 for you guys. During the next two weeks, the weather turned very cold. First came the snow. It began very suddenly one morning, just as Charlie Bucket was getting dressed for school. Standing by the window, he saw the huge flakes drifting slowly down out of an icy sky that was the color of steel. By evening, it lay four feet deep around the tiny house, and Mr. Bucket had to dig a path from the front door to the road. After the snow, there came a freezing gale that blew for days and days without stopping. And oh, how bitter cold it was. Everything that Charlie touched seemed to be made of ice, and each time he stepped outside the door, the wind was like a knife on his cheek. Inside the house, little jets of freezing air came rushing in through the sides of the windows and under the doors, and there was no place to go to escape them. The four old ones lay silent and huddled in their bed, trying to keep the cold out of their bones. The excitement over the golden ticket had long since been forgotten. Nobody in the family gave a thought now to anything except the two vital problems of trying to keep warm and trying to get, it, to get enough to eat. There is something about very cold weather that gives one an enormous appetite. Most of us find ourselves beginning to crave rich, steaming stews and hot, <clears throat> hot apple pies and all kinds of delicious warming dishes. And because we are all great deal, we are a great deal luckier than we realize, we usually get what we want or, or near enough. But Charlie Bucket never got what he wanted because the family couldn't afford it. And as the cold weather went on, and on, he became enormously and desperately hungry. Both bars of candy, the birthday one and the one Grandpa Joe had bought, had long since been nibbled away, and all he got now were those thin, cabbagey meals three times a day. Then all at once, the meals became even thinner. The reason for this was the toothpaste factory. The place where Mr. Bucket worked suddenly went bust and had to close down. Quickly, Mr. Bucket tried to get another job, but he had no luck. In the end, the only way in which he managed to earn a few pennies was by shoveling snow in the streets, but it wasn't enough to buy even a quarter of the food that seven people needed. The situation became desperate. Breakfast was a single slice of bread for each person now, and lunch was maybe half a boiled potato. Slowly but surely, everybody in the house began to starve. And every day, little Charlie Bucket, trudging through the snow on his way to school, would have to pass Mr. Willy Wonka's giant chocolate factory. And every day, as he came near to it, he would lift his small pointed nose high in the air and sniff the wonderful smells of melting chocolate. Sometimes he would stand motionless outside the gate for several minutes on end, taking deep, swallowing breaths as though he were trying to eat the smell itself. That child, said Grandpa Joe, poking his head up from under the blanket on one icy morning, that child has, <clears throat> he's got to have more food. It doesn't matter about us. We're too old to bother him. But a growing boy, he can't go on like this. He's beginning to look like a skeleton. We can, we can, we can one do, murmured Grandpa Josephine miserably. He refused to take any of ours. I hear his mother tried to slip her own piece of bread onto his plate at breakfast this morning, but he wouldn't touch it. He made it. He made her take it back. He's a fine little fellow, said Grandpa George. He deserves better than this. The cruel weather went on and on. Every day, Charlie Bucket grew thinner and thinner. His face became frighteningly white and pinched. The skin was drawn so tight over his cheeks you could see the shapes of the bones underneath. It seemed doubtful whether he could go on much longer like this without becoming dangerously ill. And now, very calmly, with that curious wisdom that seems to come so often to small children in times of hardship, he began to make little changes here and there in some of the things that he did, so as to save his strength. In the mornings, he left the house ten minutes earlier so that he could walk slowly to school without ever having to run. He sat quietly in the classroom during recess, resting himself. 
while the others rushed outdoors and threw snowballs and wrestled in the snow. Everything he did now, he did slowly and carefully to prevent exhaustion. Then one afternoon, walking back home with the icy wind in his face and accidentally feeling hungrier than he had ever felt before, his, eyes was caught, his eye was caught suddenly by a piece of paper that was lying in the gutter in the snow. Hmm. The paper was a greenish color, and there was something vaguely familiar about it. Charlie stepped off the curb and bent down to examine it. Part of it was buried under the snow, but he saw at once what it was. It was a dollar bill. Quickly, he looked around him. Had somebody had just dropped it? No, that was impossible because of the way it was partly buried. Several people went hurrying past him on the sidewalk. Their chins sunk deep in the collars of their coats, their feet crunching in the snow. None of them was searching for any money. None of them was taking the slightest notice of the small boy crouching in the gutter. Then was it his, this dollar? Could he have it? Carefully, Charlie pulled it out from under the snow. It was damp and dirty, but otherwise perfect. A whole dollar! He held it tightly between his shivering fingers, gazing down at it. It meant one thing to him at that moment. Only one thing. It meant food. Automatically, Charlie turned and began moving toward the nearest shop. It was only ten paces away. It was a newspaper and stationery store, the kind that sells almost everything, including candy and cigars. And what he would do, he whispered quickly to himself, he would buy one luscious bar of candy and eat it all up, every bit of it, right then and there. And the rest of the money, he would take straight, straight back home and give it to his mother. <laughs>